Good afternoon, my name is Susan Derwin and I am the director of UC Santa Barbara's Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. I am very happy to, happy to welcome our virtual audience to our ongoing series, Humanities Decanted. We created this series as a platform for UCSB Humanities and Arts faculty to share their newest scholarly and creative work with the campus and the broader community. I'd like now to introduce our featured scholar, Helen Morales from the Classics Department. She will be speaking to us about her newest book, Antigone Rising, The Subversive Power of the Ancient Myths, which appeared this year with Bold Type Books. Professor Morales will be in conversation with Vilna Bashi Treitler, Professor and Chair of the Department of Black Studies. Professor Bashi Treitler is a sociologist and visual artist whose work centers on the intersection of race, migration, and inequality. Professors Morales and Bashi Treitler will speak with each other for about 30 minutes, and then for 10 minutes, Professor Morales will take questions from the audience. At any time during the event, you can use the Q&A feature on your screen to submit your questions, and we will do our best to answer as many of them as we can. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our interlocutors. Thank you so much, Susan, for inviting me and um, to Vilna for today's discussion and to you all for being here. Antigone Rising is a book about how ancient Greek and Roman myths can open up new ways of looking at the world. They are not timeless, as we learn from Edith Hamilton and others. They are a discourse of power that can be used to oppress and to liberate. Greek myths have been used in the modern age as ways to reflect upon and promote modern ideologies from the alt-right to gay rights. Antigone Rising explores some of the destructive legacy of ancient myths. I look at how they have been hard, how they have hardwired misogyny into our culture. For example, how ancient myths about rape anticipate and authorize many of our beliefs and practices. In other words, how they entrench patterns of social violence. The book begins with chapters that look at how misogyny is culturally hardwired, and it starts out with the Isla Vista killings. I knew I would write about uh, misogyny when six of our students were murdered by a misogynist and racist man six years ago. So it's a book very much born of anger and born at, at, in Santa Barbara. But it moves on to discuss ways of reading myth and modern engagements with myth that promote a progressive agenda, by which I mean an inclusive, anti-racist, feminist and trans-positive agenda. And if that sounds a bit, well, worthy, be assured that there's also a female serial killer and a cannibal banquet and Samuel L. Jackson and the creepy story of how only a hundred years ago, liberal arts colleges on the East Coast like Wellesley and Swarthmore took measurements of the busts, waists, hips, height and weight of their female students and competed to see which college's composite measurements came closest to the Venus de Milo. I still find that hard to get my head around. The title Antigone Rising comes from that aspect of the Antigone myth that's glamorous and energizing. In Sophocles' play, Antigone, who is a teenager and niece of the king of Thebes, King Creon, faces a moral dilemma when one of her brothers has been killed fighting against the city. Her brother is an enemy of the state, so the body is left unburied for the dogs and vultures to eat. Antigone argues that this is sacrilegious and inhumane and strongly opposes her uncle who punished her by condemning her to death. He walls her up in a cave. By the time he realizes his mistake and goes to uh, unblock the cave to get her out, Antigone has hanged herself. So a young girl speaks truth to power. She conquers fascism. That's what most people take away from Sophocles, Antigone. Antigone is a kind of Greta Thunberg figure, and Crayon is a total fascist who deserves everything he gets. But as many of you will know, the myth of Antigone isn't as simple as that. Antigone is not a great role model for feminists. She dies, and also for much of the myth, she's a pain in the ass. She gets stuck in outrage, like so many keyboard warriors today. 
There are other versions of the Antigone myth from that told by another Greek playwright, Euripides. It only survives in fragments, uh, but we can glean that Antigone buried the body. She got married, she had a child. And there are modern versions uh, like that imagined by writer Sara Uribe in 2012 for performance in Mexico in which Antigone lives and takes collaborative action. A repeated refrain is somos muchos, we are many. So the subversive power of the ancient myths is their ability to challenge the status quo, to spark resistance and to articulate a more progressive politics. At least that's what I've argued. Um, I look forward to whether Vilna agrees with, Vilna, you agree with me. Well, thank you. First of all, I am really happy to have been chosen as your interlocutor. I, um, I loved the book. I loved it. It was a joy to read. And um, I, I know that I told you this before, but for everyone who's here, my, my husband was kind of tossling with me because he was trying to read the book at the same time that I was because he couldn't put it down either. It's really engaging, it's beautifully written, it's funny, it's tragic, it's timely, it's ancient, it's all the good things. So I wanna drink to you for you. making a really wonderful piece. After all, it's humanity's decanted, right? So thank you have so a little much. wine drinking to your success. <laughs> Thank you. I should say on the drinking front that we, we, we envisaged, but we copped out of advertising it that this, that this, well, we wanted it to be a fun event and we thought that you, people might take a drink every time they hear the word Beyonce or something. Oh. <laughs> or yes, let's see um, what they have on the bingo card. So, you know what I did? I made a list of the things that are in this book and that's a very long list. And I'm gonna read it just for the heck of it, in case anybody on, um, any viewer hasn't picked it up yet. There's climate change, sexual assault, women and girls dress codes, transforming uh, genders, sexuality and queerness, uh, killing women as being heroic, um, iconic Amazons, sex strikes, dieting, um, women controllers, misogyny, me too, rape, women and subversive craft, revenge, uh, statues and Beyonce videos and the meanings of goddesses, museums as myth makers and LGBTQ in antiquity. I mean, there's nothing you didn't cover and it's all really interesting and exciting and like I said so timely um so I my first I mean we could pick any of those things to talk about um but my first question is how did you get the idea for this book mm. well <clears throat> there are different answers to that and one answer would be as I said it, it stemmed from rage and a desire to do something um, after the Isla Vista killings. Um, another answer would be that um, in, in teaching myth, we have a, a myth is a big GE course at, at UCSB and myself and other colleagues teach it, uh, you know, every quarter and twice in the summer. And, um, and in teaching myth, I realized that things were resonating with some of my students that I hadn't been aware of. Um, so, so a prime example of that is um, uh, is when the goddess Athena in the Odyssey can change her shape and her gen her form and her gender at will. Mm -hmm. That was resonating with uh, some of my trans students, and that got me thinking. Actually, um, um, you know, we've long known that. Uh, Greek myths have played a role in political idealism um, when it comes to, for example, thinking about gay rights because um, Sappho and uh, because of um, male male love um, are models from antiquity that confirm 
that can confirm and, and validate um, uh, lesbianism in, and, uh, and gayness today. Um, but I hadn't ever thought about whether there was a similar story, if you like, for uh, trans people. And my goodness, when I opened that up, when I started to look at it, um, there was uh, a lot of, you know, uh, affirming myths for um, for trans for trans people, trans identity. And I thought we don't get we don't. That's not the story of myth that's often told, right? Those myths don't tend to get get told. Um, other myths get told, um, but but those myths don't tend to get told. So that was one one reason I wanted to um, write the book, a more positive reason I wanted to write the book. You know, and in a more diffuse sense, like many people, um, I've woken up this past four, you know, four years and thought, <laughs> you know, it, there's this cognitive dissonance about looking at, I don't know, the text of Paulinus of Nola, um, on the one hand, with everything that's going out, going, you know, going on in the world. And this book links all of those modern concerns, which the Greeks were interested in. The Greeks thought, often thought um, in more uh, interesting and complicated ways through myths about things that concern us today. And then, though, you, you took that, the, those ideas for the students, and that makes up really um, a very important but smaller part of the whole story because then you take pieces, many pieces of your life. In some ways, um, there are parts that are um, social critique and there are parts that are autobiographical. And um, I just, I, I, I found it, um, oh my goodness, sparkling, that you could fold all those things in together. So I guess I'm going to, if I have a follow up, then how did you go from that to understanding, you know, um, and putting in your daughter's middle school dress code <laughs> I, um, story, and then um, the idea of dieting and you know you put in so many more things that um had, did those come to you after you started to say well my students got something out of it let me see if i can do the same i don't know i think um i think the humanities as a whole are under pressure today um, but particularly subjects like uh, classics, um, we're often asked what's the relevance of classics, and I hate that uh, question because it's so presentist. I mean, you have to, you know, have to, it means that something's only relevant if it if it uh, resonates um, uh, today. But in, in in thinking about it, I thought classics isn't something studying ancient the ancient world and ancient myth isn't something that that feels to me like going back to the past. It is that, but it's not only that, um, because the patterns of thinking, um, the, the architecture, if you like, of, of, um, of thinking about rape narratives, um, uh, or um, the, the different ways in which um, the Venus traditions divert the, the, the sort of modern reception or modern um, ways of thinking about representing the goddess Venus um, differ starkly for white women and for black women. You know, those are, those, are, those are patterns of thinking and behaving that impact on us today all the time, right? So, so that's where things like my, so I, so I was interested, I foregrounded those moments of convergence. So like where my daughter Athena, who was then in middle school, um, the, uh, she and uh, the other girls were told um, that they, they had to follow a very strict dress code um, because otherwise their dress distracted the male teachers, right? Uh, just, um, and then that was altered to uh, 
uh, will detract from the academic environment. So we now know what that phrase really means, detract from the academic environment, right? This is a 12-year-old, 13-year-old girl. Um, and some of the way, it struck me that some of the ways in which dress is policed in our schools is very, very similar to um, the ways in which dress was policed in classical, uh, in, in ancient Athens and other Greek cities where the women controllers came out and would shame people if their dresses were too transparent or, or in, in other ways. Um, colorful, yeah. colorful is sinful. Yes, exactly, <laughs> too colorful, too, you know, when women took up too much space or were too visible in one way or another. Um, and another example would be my colleague, one of my colleagues taught a graduate course on Ovid. And um, many of the students argued that we shouldn't teach Ovid because of the repeated example, the repeated descriptions, often graphic descriptions of rape and sexual assault. Mm -hmm. and, and they're right that we should, absolutely right that we should look at those critically and we shouldn't just focus on which adjective has been chosen or how is the Latin phrase there? But it seemed to me, and this is where my own experience of sexual assault came in, it, it seemed to me that Ovid also shows um, an extraordinary ability to see the effects and dramatize the effects of, social, of, of sexual assault on the victims. So, so the, the, the call to get rid of Ovid, which in some universities has been, you know, quite forceful um, and, and seeming to come from the left, as it were, hmm. seemed to me actually uh, misguided. Yeah, that's one thing that I definitely um, touched on, that um, you you argue that um, myths can be used as models of resistance, whether or not they're interpreted accurately. <laughs> so <laughs> I really thought that that was um, quite telling that um, I, I suppose your bottom line, and let me know if I got this wrong, is that myths live because they serve political agendas and a progressive or subversive agenda as opposed to a more conservative one is just as accessible from these myths as as anything is that right yes i think that's la that's largely it right um, um that's largely it and they're polit uh, so i go back a step and say that in some ways there isn't, one of the things I wanted to show is in some ways there isn't an accurate interpretation of a myth because there are all sorts of different versions and, and were even in antiquity. Yes. We go to Sophocles version of Antigone because that's what survives, right? And because Hegel was so interested in it and that's, so it's carried on, but there's also Euripides, even if that's only in fragments and there are other models in antiquity. So myth was always a process, not, not one kind of, you know, fact or one kind of set narrative. It was always a process of being rewritten and, re and, and represented. Um, so, so, so you're absolutely right that one of the things I wanted to get across is that these, you know, myths can be used to different ideological and political ends. Um, I'd add to that that one of the benefits of thinking about um, modern ideas through ancient myths, um, because one doesn't have to turn to myth, right? And I'm not saying we, I'm not saying it's the only game in town, I'm not saying we have to turn to it, but one of the benefits of doing it is that with some of the representations of myth, like, like those that we get in Greek tragedy and those that we get in the um, Roman writer Ovid, um, those writers are very keen to complicate difficult um, ethical issues. And so much of our discourse today with, you know, Twitter and um, uh, politicians needing to talk in sound bites uh, simplifies. So one of the ways in which I think um, myth can be progressive is, is, is not just, you know, adhering to a set of a particular political positions, although I think that's, you know, 
often important. Um, but it's just that complicating in and of itself uh, can be, it isn't always, but it can be a, um, an act of resistance. Yeah, I, I see that and I, I do get that from the text. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, um, I have to look at my notes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit more about the um, myth making or interpretation of myth making as a process. Um, because, yeah, I see the way you are, you take these stories and you teach about, um, you teach about what they mean, how they've been interpreted, how there's so many versions, how they play roles in today's society. And it's, um, it's really a, 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 a gift that you have of bringing those threads all the way to the present day. So honestly, if anyone has a question about whether or not these things are relevant today, you, we could just hand someone your book because <laughs> you, you answer all the questions, <laughs> every single question. It makes me really wish I could take one of your courses because I could see I mean, I may not have ended up a sociologist if you were my professor. <laughs> well, but then I would have done the world a great disservice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But yeah, I see how much of um, sociology and, and classics really work together. And I guess that that's been the case in the fact that we've developed not just a collegial relationship, but a friendship, because we've always had lots to talk about. So, um, and I think that's been a great thing that I've had here at UCSB. Um, I guess um, I just have one more question and I don't know how to phrase it because I think it's, um, it's probably, a, a, it's a, testy, tricky question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I want to talk about the line between religious practice and mythology, mm -hmm. because if I got this right, these myths came about in a context of religious practice, sometimes mm -hmm. in a societal context that um, wouldn't allow certain kinds of critique so that these practice, well, the practices, how do I say this? So the myths were religious understandings of that, of the deities. Mm -hmm. And then the stories were used to perhaps I'm stretching it, but maybe reach some political ends where you couldn't critique the powers that be, but you could put on a stage play after the men, much later after these practices have moved over into mythology. Is that more, or am I wrong? And then, well, well let me put the whole question yeah. out there. <laughs> and then I'm saying, well, we could, um, you know, so even in the Abrahamic traditions, there are things in the holy books of many, many people that are stories that are hard to imagine happening in reality, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean. There are seeds that part on command and words that come through burning bushes and people who survive or revive after death and births that, birth, a birth that comes from a virgin and things that if, if we understood them to happen today, we would kind of be incredulous. Mm -hmm. So then I guess that's, 
I'm trying to understand where would you put these lines between myth and, I mean, is it just history that changes religious practice into mythology? Um, is it um, the arts that change mythology into political critique? <laughs> like, where, where do these lines go? And um, I'd love to hear what you think about that. And that's my last question. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, in that question. <laughs> so, um, most of our, much of our evidence, our earliest evidence, comes from archaic and classical Greece. So, classical Greece, Greek democracy, birthplace of Greek democracy, um, philosophy, tragedy, and before that, with the epics of Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. Um, and we have an, one reason why. Uh, ancient Greek, the ancient Greek and Roman traditions have been so important is we just have so much stuff surviving. We have so much written, the, the, you know, written material and uh, visual evidence surviving that we don't have from uh, many ancient cultures. Um, but the evidence that we have suggests not that, um, not that there was one picture of people believing in these myths and, and so practicing the religion and then there was mythology. Mm -hmm. right? So even at the time, Plato was saying these are terrible stories to tell about gods because they present people committing adultery and 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 yeah, and criticizing rape and you know all of the all of the appalling things that the gods did. Plato wants to be banned from his ideal city, mm -hmm. um, and his was an important voice. Um, Socrates, Plato, important voices. So it wasn't that there was one sort of religious. Uh, I, I, the, I, it's hard to get my head around this, but the category of belief in, which is so central to most modern religions, wasn't so important in antiquity. It was my, so honoring the gods was important. We know what happens when people didn't honor the gods, they were zapped or faced some hideous kind of consequences, um, according to myth anyway. Um, so it wasn't as simple as I think religion then moving into myth, although it's true that it was only in the Roman period really that people collected these stories as stories and, and, and that what we call mythographers who, who try to uh, tell these stories in competitively more outrageous kind of ways um, came, you know, came into being. Um, but one thing I think that's so different about from the ancient Greek and Roman myths and the um, uh, other traditions that you talked about is that these are polytheistic societies. Mm -hmm. So, and there's no set sacred text, mm -hmm. right? There are no rules to follow. There's no Talmud, there's no Quran, um, there's, there's no Bible, um, there's no Torah. Uh, there's no, so, so how do you, how do you as a person in ancient Greece know what to do ethically? Well, you go to the poets. That's an, again, that's an odd answer for us because we might go to a religious leader or we might go to, you know, a doctor to tell us how best to live or, you know, but, or a self-help guru. But, but in antiquity, it was people telling myths. And that's why they're so complicated and interesting. Um, in terms of wanting an emotional reaction and also an intellectual reaction. You know, that's why we have Ovid telling stories about uh, the destruction of the environment that link that with sexual abuse, the sexual abuse of women, and link that with the fact that there won't be a future and represent that as a king ultimately eating his own body, you know. Um, which in some ways is more advanced thinking than we've <laughs> than, than, than our discussions about climate change um, today. So to, Tony Morrison said, and um, Tony Morrison was drawn to uh, Greek tragedy in particular and the myths that are told in Greek tragedy um, because she said that the relationship between self and community and religion and storytelling um, are similar, uh, in Greek tragedy are similar to those found in the black communities that she grew up in. So, and that's an interesting model for me and it's a, a model that I've only got a bit of insight into, um, but it explains why she went again and again to Greek tragedy in order to, um, and the Greek myths 
told there in order to articulate black women's experience repeatedly. So oh, that, that's one way of linking your question about religion to, you know, um, right. modern concerns. Right. But when, as you were talking, it made me think that um, I, I agree with everything you said, but um, what I, I, I still want to say that um, what I know of Christianity and how it operates in the United States has a lot to do with charismatic figures who mm -hmm. deliver the word and mm -hmm. um, the, the different denominations and the idea of the, the minister or priest who delivers a sermon that helps interpret and that some of these become mega churches because their, their ma manner of taking these stories and turning them into something that's relevant and they do that for an hour each Sunday, you know, to, to me echoes some of what happens in, in the book. And then the, um, and in the Jewish tradition, how, um, you know, the idea is that everyone needs to know to how to interpret this word themselves. And that's what, you know, you welcome to bring your interpretation to the community when you've had your bar mitzvah or your bat mitzvah. So right. there is something there, even Absolutely. though there is a, a book to follow that there's still arguments about the meanings of all these things. No, absolutely. And I should just say before, just before Susan comes in that, um, uh, the reason that we have these Greek myths surviving is that um, uh, Christian and Jewish and Muslim traditions took them up and reread them and changed them. So you're absolutely right that that the um, traditions <laughs> are in some ways enmeshed, um, even as they have differences. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I do, I love the book, the way you handled um, race gender, sexuality, like it's just so timely, wonderful work. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. And Vilna, to describe any part of a text is sparkling, I think is fabulous. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to start us off with one straightforward question. And actually we have other questions coming in. I'll hold mine. Uh, what happens to the women who are raped in Ovid? Hmm. Um, so reading Ovid's descriptions of rape sequentially is like reading a list of the things that happen and are said to women who are raped today. Um, so sometimes they're not believed. Cassandra would be um, an obvious example of that. But she's cursed with, she's, she'll never be believed. She's raped and then cursed with, or she's, um, uh, uh, pursued and then told she'll never be believed no matter what she said, she says. Um, other women, um, one, one myth I found particularly interesting was that of Apollo and Daphne because Apollo pursues Daphne and she uh, escapes him by calling out to her father who turns her into a tree. Um, and Apollo then cuts her down, cuts off her branch. It doesn't cut her down, doesn't kill her, but cuts off her branches and creates the laurel wreath, um, the wreath of victors um, from her branches. And, um, and the way that Ovid describes that myth uh, is very similar to the way I felt after a sexual assault and the way that um, Chantal Miller uh, later, her, her memoir of, of being raped by the Stanford, the swimmer, Stanford swimmer, um, came out after uh, my book had gone to press. But in that, she talks about feeling as if she's wood, right? Feeling as if she'd been turned to wood. And that um, kind of paralysis um, and the way that uh, her assaulter. Um, interprets actions that the reader really thinks, you know, she's not nodding assent, um, but he interprets them differently. So, you know, that, that would be another thing to add to, add to the list in answer to the question. Um, 
women are, you know, um, the signs are misread as, as, as if they um, assent. Um, in other stories, women try to stop other women being um, assaulted, as in the rape of Persephone, um, when a, a woman is destroyed by trying to prevent that rape, which is interesting as well, thinking about, you know, the effects of, of uh, assault upon other women, you know, friends and, and so on. Um, and then I'll, you know, my final example um, will be that of uh, Procne and Philomela, um, because that's, um, that's a tale where a woman is raped by her brother-in-law and he cuts out her tongue so that she won't, when she says, I'm gonna tell everybody, um, she cuts out, uh, he cuts out her tongue, um, which, and when I think of non-disclosure agreements today, they might be less bloody, but they're also a way of stopping women telling uh, their stories. Uh, and she weaves the story instead. She's kept, she's walled up. She weaves the tale of what's happened to her and sends it to her sister, um, who's married to uh, Philomela's rapist. And her sister, Procne, believes her and uh, Philomela didn't think she'd be believed. So this is a story where a woman believes um, her sister, uh, another woman, and they plot together a way of um, getting revenge. And they serve up the child as a casserole to the king. So he eats his future, he eats his own child and he eats his future. Um, and then they, in the end, they're turned into birds, but they're birds whose song replays this myth again and again. So that's a quite satisfying revenge myth. <laughs> I don't recommend it as a, you know, uh, as a way to don't do that at home, um, but nonetheless, <laughs> In terms of reading it, you know, there's a good bit of um, uh, <laughs> satisfaction from reading that myth. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to return to your um, notion that uh, myths have both the power to entrench social behaviors into cultural norms and also that certain myths, such as those about transness, have been set aside and removed from the historical narratives that have been crafted about antiquity. The question mm -hmm. is, or the request is, for you to say a bit more about this process of selection and erasure in the ways that myths are solidified into our social practices or rejected and invisibilized in our perspectives. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, that uh, many people, many artists, many historians, uh, much of the media uh, has a lot at stake in, um, in, the in the glory that was Greece, the model of the glory that was Greece, beginning of Western civilization, um, those sort of Eurocentric, um, uh, rather distorted uh, picture of, um, of ancient Greece. Um, and so a lot of the myths that get told are those of, of heroism, of those of heroes going out and doing wonderful things, you know. Um, and the myths that get suppressed are the myths where of Apollo and his gay lover, um, and, um, or, or the myths that I talk about as trans, as trans myths. So it's often to do with who gets to do the telling um, and, and, and how they get to do the telling. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I wanted to do in the myth is to, uh, you know, um, bring to a wider audience the huge numbers of artists and playwrights and poets who use myths, who, who rewrite those myths. So I mentioned Sara Irubi, but one could talk about Cara Walker or Harmonia Rosales, um, uh, Luis Alfaro, I mean, the, the, you know, many, many artists who just put a different, Luis Gluck, who just won the um, Nobel Prize, um, all, of, all of these tell myths in a way that gives us a different slant on it. And there's, there's, there's one, I'll just give you one moment from um, uh, one of my favorite music videos, this is Ape Shit by um, the Carters. And it, we're in the Louvre, and um, the whole video is a meditation on art and museums and race. And there's one moment where we see um, 
uh, a young man outside the Louvre taking the knee in that um, uh, now iconic gesture of um, protest. And then we, and, and just before that, we have an ancient statue in a very similar pose, right? And the way that that video, that there's nothing inherently um, but it, between the statue and those men, but that the way that the video has been cut, um, antiquity is made to take part of that protest and the modern ennobles the classical, um, which is you know, uh, often a, a, a reversal of what often happens. All right, we have two whole minutes left and you get one and a half of them. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to uh, combine a couple of questions into a kind of umbrella question. Um, some of the specific questions are concerned with essentially how um, stories of violence and rape are told at times euphemistically in myth. Here's my question that sort of broadens this out. You talked about the sort of the, the pleasure and richness and value of myths in their ability to complicate ethical issues. Mm -hmm. And you said it's always good to complicate things. And um, uh, you say that this is what happens when modern ideas are looked at through ancient myths. This is one of the benefits. Mm -hmm. And I really think what you say is very important because it highlights the fact that we are always looking through a lens mm -hmm. at whatever issue, even if it's the lens of our values. Mm -hmm. are. So how do you then, given the way that certain myths say do uh, uh, treat troubling and painful situations euphemistically, how do you uh, maintain that complicating ethical issues and lenses isn't just a form of moral relativism? Hmm. In other words, if we see through the lens of perpetrators and victims, why is that valuable? Insofar as multiple perspectives are, are represented, why should we complicate issues that are painfully uh, absolute to many people? Hmm. And you have one minute. Well, uh, <laughs> because when we don't, when we don't think um, with you know in a in a nuanced kind of way and take into account different perspectives we end up in the world that we're in at the moment and, you know most of us are not happy with that world so uh, that would be that would be one you know, that That's would be my point. answer in a nutshell yeah. um, rape rape myths are often told euphemistically because the there isn't a clear language of sexual assault and consent um, in antiquity. And that's also where one has to read carefully and sometimes against the grain and, and look at different versions of, of myths. So in some ways that's something um, that's, you know, that's its own kind, I could talk about that for a long time. I haven't got a long time. Um, I would say that, you know, complicating in and of itself isn't always important. Right. Um, I mean, I, sometimes we can complicate and debate all different sides and it stops us taking action. And this is a book that very much wants us to take uh, action as, as well as think about things harder. But I do think that, you know, and, and here you come back to Antigone, getting stuck in outrage isn't going to work. Right. She gets stuck in outrage and she chooses in the end a position that is uh, powerless. And that's not good for us. And I see, so, so in some ways I'm, I criticize people on all different, you know, from all different perspectives of the political uh, spectrum. Um, and that's another way in which myth can help us is, you know, look what happens if you get so stuck in outrage. Nuance of understanding brings greater choice in decision making, yes. opens up creative possibilities for action. Thank you, Susan. Yes, you put in much more. That's, I, I think this has been just a wonderful conversation. I'm just a little jealous that you're drinking, but that's OK. Um, someone has to do it. And I want to thank both of you, Helen and Vilna, for such a dynamic conversation. Also, thanks to our fabulous IHC staff, Aaron Nursted, Adam Morrison, Paula Schaefer, who make this event run smoothly all the time. Uh, thanks to our audience for attending. 
may I ask you to please fill out the post survey um, or the short post survey and also take the opportunity if you haven't done so to sign up for our mailing list. You'll get information about our future events. Um, thank you all. And we are going to say good night. Good night. Thank you, thank you so much. Good night.